All right. Well, it is the top of the hour. And so while I see some folks still coming on in, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank uh, Ambassador Rosemary Banks uh, for joining us uh, today uh, from New Zealand. Uh, Ambassador Banks has had a 40-year career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, including six uh, previous overseas assignments. Uh, she was permanent representative of New Zealand to the United Nations in New York from 2005 to 2009, Ambassador France and Portugal, and New Zealand's permanent representative to the OECD between 2010 and 2014. She previously served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Hon Honiara and uh, Canberra, and always, also was Deputy Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, she was responsible for multilateral legal and consular affairs. Prior to her appointment as Ambassador to the U.S., uh, Ambassador Banks served as Crown Negotiator for the Treaty of Waitangi Settlement Process. You're going to have to correct me on that one, Ambassador Banks. I apologize. And she's also a member of the Council of the University of Canterbury and an adjunct senior fellow in the Department of Political Science. Uh, Ambassador Banks has provided diplomatic tradecraft training for the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Treasury, the New Zealand Defense Force, and the Papua New Guinea Department of Foreign Affairs. So I'm your host, Jamil Jaffer, and this is NSI uh, NATSEC Nightcap. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Ambassador Banks, great, great for you to be here with us. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be, and I understand I'm the first ambassador that you have invited, so I hope this will be the beginning of a, a long train of future such. You are, and we're so excited to have you. Um, you know, Ambassador Banks, and, and I hate to start with this topic, um, and frankly, it's embarrassing uh, for, uh, for us here in the United States to have to start talking about this with a foreign ambassador, but it's impossible to avoid the events that took place yesterday uh, at the U.S. Capitol um, the outrageous events that took place at the U.S. Capitol yesterday. Um, I know, I know that our our um, our allies around the world have expressed uh, their concern um, and and their sympathy for the American people. Um, I, what did Prime Minister Aaron have to say about uh, about what happened um, uh, yesterday? Yes, well, look, it was absolutely a day that uh, all your friends around the world were feeling absolute shock, but also a great deal of uh, worry. Uh, Prime Minister said she did two tweets, actually. The first one, when it was still really happening, she wrote, uh, democracy, the right of people to exercise a vote, have their voice heard, and then have that decision upheld peacefully should never be undone by a mob. Our thoughts are with everyone who is as devastated as we are by the events of today. I have no doubt that democracy will prevail. And later, after it had, she wrote a, more, uh, more of a congratulations tweet, you know, that that had prevailed. And earlier, actually, uh, our uh, foreign minister, Minister N Nanaya Mahuta, who's in fact our first uh, woman foreign minister, but also first Maori woman prime minister, uh, foreign minister, sorry. She'd also tweeted earlier and said, we regret unfolding events in Washington, DC. Our thoughts are with the American people violence has no place in thwarting democracy. We look forward to the peaceful transition of the political administration, which is the hallmark of democracy. Uh, look, everybody around the world would have been watching, and I know there have been many expressions uh, in the course of today and yesterday. Yeah, no, well, I, well, I appreciate that. And we appreciate the words of our, of our, of our ally there in New Zealand and, and your political leadership. You know, um, as we talk about what happened yesterday, and, and, and democracy did prevail, uh, at the end of the day, democracy did prevail and, and Congress uh, did its, its mm -hmm. job. Um, it counted the votes. Uh, it, it dealt with it, it with, with the objections that were brought. Um, and now we're headed towards a, a transition of power. And, and for what it's worth, the president has indicated that he will, um, uh, he will, he will you know, participate in a peaceful transition of power. Um, as we look towards that transition, though, and because we're here to talk today, not about what happened yesterday, but about the relation between the United States and New Zealand and, and New Zealand's role in in the region. Um, uh, as we look to that, that transition to power, how would you characterize the state of US-New Zealand relations? And what are, the, what are the key issues at play between our two nations? Okay, well, I can, I can say that over the last four years, we've, we've done pretty well in terms of our relationship. We feel that at the end of the current administration, the bilateral friendship and partnership is in really very good shape. We've been able to make progress in most of the areas that were really important to us. And for us, the Pacific Islands region is where we look out to when we look north. Mm. And we've had a much closer engagement over the past few years uh, with the US in that, in that area, which has been very constructive. Uh, just um, 
looking looking ahead oh, well actually just a little bit of history first you yeah. know it is a very very long relationship longer than many people realize because the u.s sent your first consul to new zealand in 1839 and so that means that uh, our our relationship started when you had your eighth president in the white house so 38 presidents that we've worked with so you've had a bit of practice Maybe. And of course, uh, we're already thinking very much about what the next one uh, will be. But in terms of the issues that, yeah. uh, that, that we've been working on, of course, in the most recent period, the pandemic has been the big issue for every country. And between the, the New Zealand and the US, we're looking to you, as most countries are, many countries are, as a source of, of vaccines. Right. We've also been exchanging our, our lessons learned and, and our scientific data uh, too amongst specialists. So that's been a big one. Uh, over the last few years, there's also been a very big focus from both our countries on the Indo-Pacific as the kind mm -hmm. of centre of change globally now, centre yes. of economic uh, progress and technological change. And we've been attending very closely to what the Trump administration put out as the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and what right. that would really mean in practice. Uh, a big focus area for us as well. But I have to mention the sort of the most surprising area of, of progress over recent times between our two countries is actually space cooperation. Now, you probably think about New Zealand, you might think about dairy cows or bungee jumping or spectacular Lord of the Rings type landscapes. You right about uh, low orbit rocket launching, but we're actually doing that very successfully from a very remote peninsula on the eastern coast of the North Island, including launching small payloads into space for the US, for NASA, for USA. Wow. So that's been a, that is really sort of the big exciting different uh, right. happening in the relationship. That's really terrific. Um, you know, are there are there any particular areas of challenge between our two countries at, at, at the current time? Not really particular areas of challenge between us. I mean, I yeah. think we we share many areas of challenge, Certainly. and we'll no doubt go on to talk about some of those. I guess the area that where we are perhaps more ambitious than the US is is in in trade and taking our yeah trade and economic relationship further forward. We, for example, are the only member of the Five Eyes uh, group that doesn't have some kind of preferential trade access, free trade agreement, or at least one uh, on the way. Right. And uh, again, a little bit of history. It turns out that we first raised the idea of a preferential trade access with the US in 1871. We raised it again wow. much more directly uh, in 1939, and then we sort of got clobbered by the outbreak of the war. So you have to say that we're persistent because we right. would still like to get there, but we realize that at the moment, it's, uh, there are uh, many, many things on the US uh, agenda, right. and we're not, with our request for a free trade agreement, we're not gonna be at the top of that list, but we'll keep yeah. asking. And what, how do you expect the relationship to change as we go through this transition uh, to the new Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration? Do you expect the relationship to change significantly or is it, is it largely the kind of relationship that will largely say the same? Some things may change at the margins, but by and large, the relationship is strong and will continue on that path. Yeah, look, both of those really. Um, foundations of the relationship are strong and established and they won't change significantly, we wouldn't expect. But there will be quite a lot of, of, of opportunity for new work together, particularly on climate change. Uh, that's obviously a very top priority for the Biden administration coming in. It's a very right. top priority for my government too. And I'm sure that in both areas of sort of domestic policy, what we're both doing, although yours is a hugely different context to our own, um, but also in terms of the Paris Agreement, the return of the right. US to the Paris Agreement, working together to get progress there and to get some more um, ambitious targets set. So I think that that will certainly be, uh, be one area of change. 
The other main one, I think, will be on the multilateral organisation side. Uh, yeah. New Zealand, as a smaller country, has always had to depend very much on the, the, the architecture, really, the, uh, the rule of law that the international right. organisations uh, provide for countries like us. Now, we know they're not all in great shape at the moment, but we really want to be able to work with the US on priority organisations like the World Trade Organization, like the World Health mm. Organization, uh, to get those working better or to modernize in the case of right. WTO where we need to. So I, it's interesting, um, you know, if, if you had to brief the new incoming administration, right, there, there are issues that they're going to be more aligned uh, with, with New Zealand's policy on uh, climate change is clearly one. Um, and I think, and I believe the Biden administration indicated on day one, they plan to re-enter the Paris, uh, the Paris Climate Accords. Um, but it sounds like you're actually looking to lean a little forward, uh, even, even beyond where Paris, did I, did I hear that right? That you're looking to set even more ambitious targets than where Paris is, is that, is that right? Yes, um, whether that's achievable or not, I don't know, but certainly that's an aspiration that we would hope that we can get some more ambitious targets set. I mean, we're really, facing this in our Pacific Islands region, they have always been at the, at the front edge of the impact of climate change. And many of those smaller governments who don't figure globally all that much have been very influential in driving the global climate change discussion. And they are absolutely adamant that if we don't get, if we don't at least achieve the, the, uh, the target of no further warming than 1.5 degrees Celsius, yeah. that they are in serious trouble. So we've got, yeah. you know, immediate kind of regional and even uh, national uh, security concerns to, to really get some action. Yeah, well, let's talk about that because, you know, a lot of people, you know, as you know, climate change is a hotly debated issue in the United States. And I, I don't think there's, a, there's that much debate about whether climate change is a real thing. There is some debate about that, but that's largely the margins, right? But the question about what to do about the changing climate uh, is, is hotly debated in the United States, as you well know. Um, and, and I, think it's, I think it's interesting because you just described it as a national security issue. And there's a debate in the U.S. about whether it's even appropriate to talk about climate change as a national security issue. Why in, why in, in the view of New Zealand um, and, and maybe other Pacific Islands nations too, um, is, is, uh, is climate change a national security issue for you all? And why should we see it, if you believe we should, as a national security issue for the United States? I think it's perhaps easier for us to, to view it that way because we're seeing it more directly. I think you're going to start seeing it very directly here too. I mean, if you talk to people in Florida or any of the coastal areas that are already seeing uh, rising sea levels, then they're pretty focused on it too. Right. But, you know, for New Zealand, uh, for us, we have very, very close relationships with the Pacific Islands. People come and go a lot. So even if we were being completely selfish, we would say, well, you know, what's going to be the livelihoods? Where, where are those people going to go? Right. A lot of them, if they can no longer live, have a livelihood, have security, have even a place to stand up in their right. own islands, they're going to want to come somewhere else. And like for a large number of them, that will be towards New Zealand. But so you're concerned about a, a sort of a, almost a refugee flow situation arising out of the climate change situation with respect to some of the some of the smaller islands that are vulnerable to rising seas. Is that right? I, w I wouldn't want to put that as the as the top priority. I mean, as the top motivator. Our top motivator really is to ensure that that our region can still stay stable. And right. we also see, you know, climate change as you've seen it in Africa and elsewhere as an accelerator of other problems, certainly of people movement. But you know, of, of loss of of being able to fish properly or grow mm. food. With in right. the Pacific, we're already getting um, problems with salination. So right. the areas where they used to be able to grow food reliably are now not possible to use. So you know, it, it is coming. It is coming home to us quite quite directly. That makes sense. You know, by the way, I want to mention for the audience um, uh, at about at about you know, 35, 40 past, we'll be turning to you all for questions. So please, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the Q&A box, and we'll be happy to take your questions uh, as we get to that part of the conversation. Um, you know, Ambassador, you mentioned climate change. If you had a chance to see the president on his first week in office, President Biden, I mean, you had a chance to brief him on sort of the top three things that New Zealand cares about. Um, I assume climate change is on the list, but what, what's your, what are your top three? 
Yeah, well, climate change would, would, of course, be one of them. And in fact, that's already been discussed when our Prime Minister had a first congratulatory phone call with, with President-elect Biden. Right. There was some controversy about that, as I recall. Um, in what sense? Well, the, the, you know, one of the one of the concerns back in the in, when the, when President Trump was taking office was, you know, that they were having conversations about policy issues, uh, or, or the, you know, famously the National Security Advisor was having conversations about policy issues with the Russians, and that led to, as we know, all sorts of all sorts of shenanigans. Um, the the concern was, well, here's here's President Biden taking congratulatory phone calls, and he's having policy conversations. I, by the way, don't tend to think there's a problem with any incoming administration having policy phone calls. That's the nature of the business. But it, it was actually interesting, controversial. It wasn't just New Zealand. It was a number of countries where this, this issue of Paris and climate change came up. OK, well, just moving to answer your question. So the second priority that we would have would be uh, our cooperation on Indo-Pacific. And I know that's going to be a it's already a priority for the, the uh, current administration and will be, of course, a priority for uh, for the Biden administration. But what we wonder about is whether actually everyone will realize just how much the region has changed even in four years time, so in, in the past four years. So I think one of our bits of advice if we had the luxury of offering it would be uh, to register that we would hope for early engagement in the Indo-Pacific region at a senior level right. so that the top people here could sit down with leaders in the region, really talk to them about what kind of engagement they want to have with the US, how that would be done, get to know them and get to know their priorities. So that that's something that's pretty important. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a kind of selfish interest, if you like. Right. We just want right. to be operating really well with good engagement from the US, including in the economic sphere, mm. not just as a security presence in the in the region. Right. And I think I already touched on the, the third the third issue would be for us pretty much the World Trade Organization because mm. it's a real concern and eventually it'll be a real concern for the US as well that we don't have a proper dispute mechanism running at the moment for working out uh, trade disputes. And so we would really want to urge the incoming administration to focus on that. There are already some good um, possible solutions uh, on the table. And, and then, as I again mentioned earlier, you know, to then work out how do we get a group of really uh, focused countries together to, to see how we can modernize the organization. Yeah. It's not going to be a happy world if we all revert to bilateral trade scraps, as we've seen some examples of in recent times. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an important point. You know, one of the things uh, you talked about the Indo-Pacific and the importance of the region and, and the Trump administration put out their, uh, their uh, policy uh, for free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on, on the situation in the region um, and, and how we see the, the current quad relationship playing out. And in particular, the U.S. has had a pretty challenged relationship with China over the last four years. Um, and, uh, and, you know, wherever the blame for that lies, um, you know, I, the, the question is, how does New Zealand fit into the larger quad dynamic and the, the U.S.-China dynamic that's been taking place? And do you expect to see changes in that dynamic uh, here uh, as we go through this transition? Well, take the quad part first. New Zealand sees itself very much as, of course, and we are geographically as well as kind of economically and socially as part of the, the wider Indo-Pacific community. The quad, uh, we remind ourselves, the quad grouping of four countries, US, Japan, Australia, and India, actually goes back to 2004, where it was set up as a cooperation mechanism for recovery from the Asian tsunami that happened around actually about now, just a little earlier mm -hmm. that year. And it's gone through a few evolutions since. Now, more recently, it's come to be seen as a kind of a countering China group, which we don't see it as. And I don't think mm. all of its members see it as either, but that's kind of the slant it's been given here in the US more. Uh, we see it as a useful bit of, of supplementary regional architecture, if you like. Um, we see it as having real value in, in bringing together countries who see things the same way and, you know, shoring up the rule of international 
international rule of law, maritime security, but we see it as really sitting alongside and complementing the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast mm -hmm. Asian Nations, because that is still the central bit of architecture in the Indo-Pacific. Right. And it's not either or, of course, it's, um, you know, it's, it's the two being both useful in different ways and for different purposes. Right. Well, you I know, think, yeah, mm -hmm. no, go ahead, please, please. No, you go. No, I was just going to say, I think the other part of your question was how do we fit into the sort of changing relationship between the US and China. And, right. you know, I think I think all of our countries are going through an, an evolution in, in how we engage with China. Uh, for New Zealand, it's it's a hugely important relationship. And I, I, could, uh, I could sit on very safe ground by quoting our prime minister uh, recently at a, a conference where she was asked the same question and she described the relationship as mature and, and strong. But she did go on to acknowledge that it's also a relationship that's become a lot more complex, a lot more multidimensional. Now, it's our top trading partner, uh, pretty close to Australia, but it is ahead of Australia as a trade partner. But of, at the same time, we have very different views on human rights. We have very different views on what should be happening in Hong Kong. And we've been open about those. Right. Uh, as far as the relationship between the US and China goes, of course, you know, these are the two big relationships in the world. And, and so we want to see them working out in a, in a way that, that doesn't exacerbate tensions elsewhere in the world. And we hope, we hope that can be possible. But we realize this is, a, you know, quite a, quite a, a, a turning point. Right. No, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, we talk about the Quad and the Indo-Pacific region, but, you know, New Zealand's been a partner of the United States in other ways for a very, very long time. In particular, you mentioned the Five Eyes relationship, which is, it's funny that we can, we sort of now talk about the Five Eyes like it's, like it's, you know, a common thing to talk about, but it's only been in recent years that that term has even really been acknowledged, although it's been out there for longer. Uh, tell us about, you know, um, uh, this inter intelligence sharing relationship. What is New Zealand's role in this long-standing intelligence alliance, and and how has it changed since it sort of has become common d discussion fodder, you know, uh, for for public discussion? Well, let's just say how it's changed since the beginning. I mean, it started out as as you know, uh, as a really a narrow intelligence sharing arrangement between a small group of allies in the Second World War, and, and they were by nature countries that, that shared values that already even then shared quite a lot of history. So it was a very sort of comfortable arrangement. It took quite a time for it to broaden out into other spheres. So it, it has now, I mean, it's it covers border security, it covers law enforcement. It's moved even into much wider areas over the last period of the pandemic, for example, the Five Eyes countries talked about global supply chain security, about food security, there's, there's, you know, there, there are numerous um, connections. Yeah. So for us as the smaller partner in the Five Eyes, it's hugely valuable. We really benefit from being able to get the, not just in the intelligence sphere, which of course is very important, but, uh, you know, to, to have shared learning, to have shared understandings of our, our wider uh, global environment. I think we bring some specifics with, from our region to the table, um, and we, we hope that the the arrangement will will continue on into the future. Right. You know, one of the areas that I think is is uh, has been at the heart of the intelligence sharing alliance, obviously, is, is is a collection of intelligence information. But you know, the sort of the modern version of that, the modern challenge of that space, uh, seems to be cybersecurity. Right. And and one of the biggest challenging actors in, in, in the world, at least for the United States, from the United States perspective um, in the cybersecurity area is, is China. Um, and it's 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 in the U.S. view, it's our, it's their theft of intellectual property uh, for the United States, as well as a number of other things. Um, you know, and then there are other players, too, uh, in this space. But how does how's the how is the, the New Zealand government thinking about the uh, the challenge of large scale cyber espionage? Uh, the challenge of cybersecurity. We've obviously just seen in the U.S. the solar winds hack out. It's around the world, but but in particular focused on the United States. Um, how, how does how does how does New Zealand see that issue, and how does that issue, if at all, fit into 
the context of the Five Eyes relationship? Well, certainly cybersecurity is a, a, a real concern for us. And just a few weeks ago, really, uh, cyber attacks brought down the entire New Zealand stock exchange for several days in a row. Right. And, and they're even now still working on, you know, working out how to strengthen it against such future things. We've got a national cyber security center, which is part of our intelligence community. And they've relatively recently uh, updated our cybersecurity strategy. And and, and, uh, to try to become more resilient, to try to be more proactive in in dealing with cybercrime. But, you know, a hugely difficult issue for for all of us. Uh, We have had occasions where we've, we've either joined with the US and other Five Eyes partners, I think we've usually done it in that company in calling out mm. some of the countries who've been proven really as good as you can to be the sources of such. And that's included the DPRK, it's included right. Russia, it has included China. So, you know, we're very conscious of the, uh, the, the threat to our security as it is to, to others. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, just again for the audience, just a reminder that in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to turn to your audience questions. So please put your questions in the chat box, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the Q&A box, um, and we'll, uh, we'll come to them here uh, in just a few minutes with Ambassador Banks. You know, uh, Ambassador Banks, you talked about uh, the, the calling out uh, of certain countries and, and, and certain challenges uh, when it comes to these cyber activities. You know, the, one of the most prominent aspects of this has been the, uh, the U.S. decision to, uh, and frankly, other nations' decision to bar uh, Huawei, uh, the Chinese telecommunications giant. Uh, where did New Zealand end up in that in that uh, dynamic, um, and and why why did New Zealand end up in that place? Yeah, well, look, we've got a um, we've got a, a national security legislation well, for for communications mm-hmm. uh, framework. It's uh, it's quite a complicated uh, name of the act, but it's we we refer to it as the TICSA, well, so I'm just going to use that. Okay. Telecommunications information security something anyway we've had that since 2014 and so this what happens for any telecommunications provider if they want to use some offshore stuff which is always because we don't produce a huge amount right. of it ourselves then it has to go through an independent um, assessment um, process and in the case of Huawei in 2018 the conclusion of the independent analysis was that it, they couldn't, um, they could not say that it was not going to be to provide any any threat to our security. Right. And so the uh, request was not granted. The request to use Huawei five G equipment was not granted, mm. and that's the situation as it still stands. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, New Zealand was ahead of the game uh, in, in addressing this issue. Um, and in particular, you know, what, what some of our allies, you know, had gone the, had gone other directions. They had they simply had a vetting procedure. And it now seems like the, the in, in large part, the the Five Eyes Alliance is united around this issue. But it wasn't all that way. And it was impressive that New Zealand was ahead of the game on that. How particularly given your situation in the region, you know, I'm interested, to th- I'm interested now to talk about the Pacific Islands uh, before we before we go to the audience questions. You know, you mentioned uh, the importance of Pacific Island, you know, region uh, and, and, and to New Zealand mm-hmm. in particular. Talk to us about, you know, what the key issues going on in the Pacific Islands are. And in particular, I'm interested because, you know, China is such a big issue for the United States. How do you see the role of China in the Pacific Islands environment? Is, is, it, is it a threat or an opportunity? Is it both? How, how, does, how does China look to the Pacific Islands community? Well, I think it, I think it you know, it, it is, depends on who you are and where you're sitting. It is, it is an opportunity and, and it can be a risk. Uh, the Pacific Islands are increasingly in a fragile situation right at the moment, especially post COVID. Not that the health side of it has hit them so much, it's more the economic side. So loss of tourism, loss of remittances from people working abroad. Mm. Uh, they're already in a difficult situation as we've already discussed through climate change uh, transnational crime, uh, illegal, unregulated fishing. So the poor old Pacific has a huge number of problems. Now, there are some very large and generous donors. Uh, it's the center of our, our um, development assistance is mm-hmm. focused on the Pacific. 
but we're not by any means the biggest. Certainly Australia and Japan are, are major donors. But even putting all of us together and what the US contributes and other lesser uh, contributors, we still can't meet the needs of the Pacific. So if you're sitting in the Pacific, you're gonna look at China and say, look, here's an opportunity. They're offering development assistance, they're offering loans, they're offering infrastructure development. And so they, they will want to accept that. And we're not gonna sit there and say, you can't. What we want to see is that the kind of development assistance that China is offering to the Pacific is of a high quality, does fit mm. with what the Pacific Islands themselves have defined for their development needs. And they're all perfectly capable of doing that and doesn't lead into a, a debt trap risk. Uh, that hasn't always been the case that unfortunately right. those, uh, those conditions have been met. So it's, um, it's again, like, like other aspects of relations with China, it's a, it's a changing, it's a changing relationship yeah. that China is having in the Pacific. Yeah, I mean, we've seen we've seen this challenge around the globe, uh, perhaps yeah. most prominently in Africa uh, with China mm -hmm. um, and and development assistance. Uh, you know, but I'm interested. To, I'm interested to know is it, is it is it moving in a positive direction? Is it moving in the right direction? Is it moving in the wrong direction? And how how is New Zealand able to shape what China is doing with this development assistance in the region? Is it is it is it is it simply New Zealand providing its own assistance as a, as a, as a, as, a, as sort of a, a different opportunity and shaping the marketplace in that way, or is it sort of is it really having an influence on the actual things that China is offering to the Pacific Islands? Well, one thing that we did do, which was quite interesting quite a number of years ago now, is that we, we, we said to China, let's do a joint project. Uh, and so we actually did a joint project in the way that we intended to use as a kind of a demonstration case if yeah. you like as to right. how you how you went about dealing with the Pacific government uh, to ensure that they were part of the whole process that they right. were fully engaged in the decision making and we did that but we only did it as far as I know we only did it the once. one time mm. right <laughs> right. Um, well, we have a lot of questions from the audience. I see 13 questions in the Q&A box, and I've got a couple in my, in my chat queue. So uh, if you don't mind, we'll just turn to those if that's sure. all right. Yeah, uh, sure. So, we, so, uh, so we have Julian Barnes uh, from the New York Times, um, and he asks about, um, about Huawei, since we were just talking about it. Um, you know, does, do you, does New Zealand expect the Biden administration um, to change the tough stance, the relatively tough stance that the uh, Trump administration has taken on, on, on Huawei? And um, or, or alternatively, will it be more successful at bringing allies uh, to the U.S. position uh, that Huawei is, in fact, a danger, a, a, a position that, as you point out, New Zealand recognized uh, quite a while back? No, well, just to, um, to pick up on that very last point that you've made, what I should make very clear, and I should have made it clear when I described the uh, independent assessment process that we put Huawei through, we are totally uh, country and provider neutral. So when that assessment process is made, it's not like we're looking at Huawei any differently or the right. fact that it's from China any differently. Right. No, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to get into the territory of, of trying to hypothesize or predict what the Biden administration uh, will do or what view they would take on an issue like that. I think we, we wait and see. Fair enough. Um, one, of our, um, one of our visiting fellows, uh, Lori Gordon, um, asked about space since you mentioned this uh, the new the new uh, the, or new ish uh, relationship between the U.S. And, and and New Zealand on space launches. Um, she asked about uh, the sector priorities for trade and economy. Where does space fall in that sort of racking and stacking of of the important things in the New Zealand economy? Uh, we know that Rocket Lab out there is obviously a premier launch company um, that has that has really sort of taken the commercial space sector by by storm. Um, and at the same time. Um, as we think about your government space enterprise, is it going to focus on sort of environmental and earth sensing issues uh, and priorities? Or is it, uh, what, what is sort of the government thinking about its space enterprise versus the private enterprise that's sort of, you know, in, in the rocket lab scenario? Well, the, the rocket lab, well, space to answer your first question in terms of, you know, where does it sit in, in, in our overall priority of sort of what's great, what's important for the economy isn't very important yet, mm -hmm. but 
it's uh, it's no doubt going to be a growing area. We're quite fortunate in terms of our geographic location in that way, and also it provides kind of redundancy for the US as another another place to to launch from. The other thing that we we're doing well, just to digress a little bit, is yeah. uh, the tracking of space debris. Mm. So there's a very large new uh, radar, very specialised kind, just been set up in the in the middle of the South Island where I come from. Uh, about 18 months ago, and that's doing uh, that's doing really necessary work in, in mm -hmm. tracing the litter out there, which is you know a, a big threat to all of Huge our threat. systems Absolutely. and to our security, indeed. So to, to come to your question about you know what is our New Zealand space agency really focused on? They're more focused on the kind of policy settings. I mean, there's very close, there's very good coordination between them and mm -hmm. the commercial side between Rocket Lab. And Rocket Lab started with a lot of government support initially. I think it, you know, it literally started out of a garage in Auckland about 12 years or so ago. Um, but some of the areas that we'd be focused on now are the big international issues like sort of regulation of what happens in mm. space and and how do you deal with problems like space debris, et cetera? Yeah, one of our, one of our uh, folks in the audience, uh, Sanjay Singhal asks about whether there are opportunities for US-based satellite and new space businesses to work with the New Zealand Space Program. Do you, do you see there being a strong bilateral relationship there when it comes to sort of uh, businesses here and businesses there? I think, I think there will be. I think there is yeah. potential for that. And certainly we're in every sphere of business, we're very open to to cooperation and working with US companies. I mean, we trust each other's right. law and we've got, you know, generally a good framework to do business within. Right. So I can't see um, why it wouldn't extend there too. Absolutely. You know, uh, Ambassador, one of the things that we we haven't talked about yet, um, and I know it's it's been a domestic issue, but obviously the New Zealand has led now internationally on, on uh, the issues that happened in Christchurch. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, the killings uh, in Christchurch. Uh, Harold Moss, one of our visiting fellows, asks about that, that horrific event, um, the extremist uh, killings. Um, and he, and he, he relates it to what happened yesterday uh, here in the US. Um, and he, he worries about the extremist threat here in the US. And he wants to, he's interested to know how concerned you are about the growing threat of domestic extremists, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, the growth in the Indo-Pacific uh, as an economic opportunity zone for, um, for populations from elsewhere. Well, that uh, dreadful terrorist attack at the mosques in Christchurch was certainly a wake-up call for New Zealand in all sorts of ways. Uh, and in the in the aftermath, and um, with more kind of targeted monitoring of what was going on on the on the dark web and what sort of views, etc., were being uh, characterised, we we certainly found that we had more of a concern about sort of extremism than we thought we had. Right. So, and we're very grateful too for the fact that immediately after those attacks, we had really good cooperation from the FBI and your security services to help us work out whether that particular uh, killer was on his own or whether he was part of a network or right. what might, might happen next. So thank you for that. But, you know, one of the good things that did come out of it, if you can find anything good out of an event like that, was the determination that our Prime Minister expressed straight away that we would right. do our very level best to make sure that that kind of extremist, violent incident or coverage couldn't go on, just couldn't be put online in the way that, it, that that one was. And so working very closely with France, that we worked up this... Uh, Christchurch call to action, right. which is a voluntary agreement. And there's now, I think, uh, 50, maybe more, around 50 to 60 countries have signed right. on to that. Unfortunately, not yet the US, but sort of like our free trade agreement, we're going to keep that <laughs> at you. Sure, that's right. Maybe more luck in, in future. Uh, and and the, the, the unique thing about this is that it brought together governments, the, all of the big tech U.S. big tech companies and civil society. Now, we haven't heard yeah. much about it publicly in the last year because everybody's been so focused on COVID. Right. But work has been going on in the background, including 
the establishment of a protocol for how governments and companies react very quickly in future such instances. Now, this is obviously a huge problem. The Christchurch Court of Action is a very, very small part of addressing it. But at very right. minimum, what it's done is it's produced a new dialogue space that didn't exist before, that brings together, you know, 50 or 60 countries who are worried about this, who want to do their best to prevent it from happening in their own societies. I should stop. You've probably got other questions. No, that was no, that was that was the, the you know, look. It's a very important issue, um, and and New Zealand really has led. Uh, in an important way. And, and what's really interesting about the Christchurch call is that is that unique blend, as you point out, uh, it's not just nation states, mm. it's, it's companies uh, and nonprofits. And so it's a very interesting uh, dynamic. We've seen other other aspects, like other things like that also, um, but but it, but obviously such a critical and such a terrible event um, and such an important thing that y'all are doing that space. Um, so, uh, Christopher Melling um, asks about, about the situation in uh, the Middle East and Afghanistan, um, and he's interested in uh, the projections for the future role of, uh, of New Zealand military operations uh, in that region. Um, he's been out of the military for a few years, but he recalls as of 2018 seeing uh, New Zealand officers serving in Qatar and Afghanistan. Um, is that, does that remain sort of a priority for, the, uh, for your government uh, serving in those, in those uh, locations? And, and if so, how do you see that either changing or not changing going forward? Right, really right from the early history of New Zealand, we've always seen, although we're a smaller country, that we had a part to play in ensuring global security. So, you know, if you go right back, we were at the Boer War, we were at the First World War, Second World War, Vietnam, Malaya, Malaya confrontation, you name it. Right. And so when uh, Afghanistan uh, became an area that we all had to try to do something about, we went there, we were there right from the beginning of the, right. that we were setting up a provincial reconstruction team uh, pretty much early after the US went in. So we've been in Afghanistan for 20 years um, and we've just only very recently, our ministers have decided to reduce our footprint, which is now already very, very small, mm. uh, but we're still there and we'll be there until May of this year. Actually, uh, I can't really project into what our, you know, what priority um, our ministers would put in future on being engaged in the Middle East or, or Afghanistan. As you may know, we had a change of government, or not a change actually, the same government was returned, but in a slightly different coalition pattern right. last October. And uh, our ministers have, have asked for a, a look at our, our future military footprint, what we'd be doing in future. We're currently also in the process of doing a new strategic defense assessment, which we do about every two years. Yeah. So it'll emerge from that, but I'm not in a good spot uh, to answer the question very well at the moment. Well, that makes sense. Uh, Courtney Greeley, one of our visiting fellows, um, uh, talks about sort of the, the relation between New Zealand, China, and the United States. Um, I mean, she's interested because, uh, you know, she notes that, um, at the end of 2020, uh, your foreign minister, who you mentioned earlier, I was quoted as saying that New Zealand tends to work with productively, most productively with countries that share its, its values. Um, and she went on to say that even though New Zealand and China are have a mutual respectful relationship, uh, they have, they're very different countries with uh, different value systems. Given those statements, uh, is, is, is New Zealand willing to make compromises in, in sort of those uh, values if, if it, if it, if it, creates better, more favorable economic relationships? You know, just recently, I don't think I can remember the exact quote, but you'll recall recently the big uh, controversy over the Chinese tweet of, a, of a, an Australian soldier appearing in a, yes, an, adopted, yes. an adopted video yes. to be threatening an Afghan child. Well, our Prime Minister spoke up very strongly about that at the time. And then we were, I think, uh, reminded by China that they didn't see this as appropriate, to which she then sort of countered that, that we would stand by our principles when we saw those principles being, you know, um, challenged or, yeah. or rejected, we would speak out on that, whatever the country. 
And so, you know, for, for all of us, there there is a real challenge in finding that balance between having a constructive relationship with a very important partner that we need to have that with, but also being prepared to to hold to our values and and speak out yeah. when we feel that that we must. Yeah, I'm I'm confident we will continue to do that. There's a couple of uh, uh, China-related questions that I, I figured I might ask ask in in a, in, in a group. Um, one at, one one of our attendees asked about how how concerned your government is about Chinese malign influence in the region. Um, you know, China is obviously a very public spat, as you as you mentioned with Australia. Um, another questioner asks about um, how much the Pi the Pacific Island nations rely on uh, your Five Eyes relationship uh, to assess risk uh, of Chinese endeavors in the region. Um, and then finally, a third uh, questioner asks about um, uh, Eric Ed Kitt asks about um, how concerned you are um, um, uh, with respect to uh, Chinese influence. Oh, I guess it's, it's actually the same question. That's the same question as, as, as the earlier question. So, um, how, how what is the what is the feeling in New Zealand about about the Chinese relationship with other nations in the region, uh, their influence, um, and in particular. Um, do the Pacific Island nations rely on you for help, uh, particularly when it comes to Five Eyes relationship, understanding what the Chinese intentions and plans are? Well, the Pacific Islands are, they're also, or not all of them, some of them are actually constitutionally part of new, of the New Zealand realm, so that it's, you know, Nui, Togolau and Cook Islands, but right. everybody else, they're all sovereign governments who make their own assessments. I mean, we can have discussions about what we perceive as risks that have been shown to be risks elsewhere in the world, as we touched mm -hmm. on earlier. Yes. But, you know, they will make their own independent assessment of the costs and benefits of the risks and the uh, benefits of their relationships, their own with China. Um, sorry, what was the other, the other bit of the question? Uh, I think the question was about was just more generally about about Chinese malign influence in the region, how concerned you are about about sort of their efforts. Uh, we you touched on it briefly uh, with respect to uh, with respect to uh, their development assistance. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's a there's a more specific one that somebody else has. Maybe I'll, I'll try this one and see if this one helps flesh it out. Um, uh, the question related to specifically uh, humanitarian assistance exercises in cooperation with the PLA on those humanitarian assistance efforts. Uh, do you worry about security concerns about about exposing New Zealand tactics and procedures in the course of those humanitarian exercises? And, and if not, should the U.S. participate, do you think, in, in those joint exercises when it comes to humanitarian matters? Yeah, I have to admit that I'm not actually cited on what humanitarian exercises we have done with the PLA. Mm. I'm not even sure that we have. Okay. So unless your, your questioner can specify that, then... <laughs> Um, okay. Well, let's see. Yeah, we do let's have, you know, we do have exchanges uh, at a kind of a, a, a policy level with the sure. PLA, but I'm not aware that we have any actual operational exercise. Great. That's helpful. Um, let's see. I've got a, I've got a question on climate change uh, from Abraham King. Mm -hmm. um, he's interested to know about what New, New Zealand's view on sort of the priorities within the climate change arena, right? How do, how do they play out? Um, Reducing carbon emissions, switching to renewables, uh, removing CO2 from the air, et cetera. What are what are what are the priorities within the larger climate change? But we'll understand that it's an it's an important issue for New Zealand. Uh, do you all have, do you have a sense of what what New Zealand's priorities are and how those relate to uh, the U.S. and on our view of Paris and the like? Okay, well, look, I, I just start domestically on that, and and at the domestic uh, in domestic priorities, it's certainly a case of renewables, which we've got a, a plan, uh, a goal to be completely renewable energy by, that one's 2030. Uh, that's but that's not so dramatic for us because we're over 80% now. So that- you Is know, that that's, right? Yeah, because wow. of hydro, hydropower. Yeah. So we've, you know, that sounds really a great uh, target, but it, it's not gonna be hugely hard uh, to reach. Carbon emissions and, um, reducing those is going to be is is also right up there for us. Our zero carbon act that was passed in November uh, 2019 has a a, a, a a net zero carbon target for 2050. Now that's going to be very challenging for us because a lot of our emissions actually come from agriculture. 
Mm. And 80% of our our goods exports are still either food, fiber, beverages, but you know, basically out of the agriculture sector. Right. Now, this is quite interesting though, in terms of the possible cooperation between our countries in future, because I think the uh, Biden administration is looking to have to, for the uh, for the U.S. agriculture sector to be carbon neutral by I've forgotten the exact date, but it might be mm. also 2050, or to be at least to be the first. I think that's perhaps the way it's expressed to be the first agriculture sector to become carbon neutral. Well, I you know I would say good luck with that one. <laughs> right, right. Thank you all the way. Uh, we're doing all the research we can through a, an organization that we helped to launch uh, in right. 2009 called the Global Research Alliance on Agriculture Greenhouse Gases. And we have succeeded to some extent. We, we've been reducing agriculture um, emissions by 1% per year ever since. And that doesn't sound like much, but you know that can add up to a lot. Sure. So sure. There, are, there are sort of you know, and also the transportation sector is one that we're focusing on very much as a priority. And we'll right. definitely look to, to what's happening here to help us in that, in that uh, sector. Gotcha. Um, one, our, our Director of International Programs, Mario Kanji, um, asks about uh, ASEAN and the uh, world's biggest trade pact that was signed in, uh, in, in November 2020. Uh, the US is obviously absent from that trade pact. Um, what, is, uh, what does that imply for the world or particularly the, re the Indo-Pacific region um, in terms of potential decoupling from the US? Do you, do you, do you, are you concerned about that? Do you see that as a real, as a real threat or is that overblown? No, we are, con we are concerned about it. I mean, the ideal for us would be to see the US come back to what is now the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, so CPTPP. It's hard to get all those P's right. right. Um, we really would like to see that happen. Uh, it may be that it's going to be very difficult to turn the clock back since the US had joined what was the old Trans-Pacific Partnership yeah. back in 2016, but you know withdrew in 2017. We are missing you in the region and uh, the world doesn't stop. These these new uh, trade relationships have been developed since. Yeah. It was thanks to Japanese leadership that the TPP was salvaged and became yeah. the CPTPP. Is now eleven countries, but you know a big chunk. And then the one that you've just alluded to, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership (RCEP) that was just signed last year, and that does include China. It's not as high a quality. Uh, trade agreement, you know, right. the the, uh, the thresholds for uh, good behaviour, if you like, aren't quite as high. Right. But the good side is that it's got it's got China in it, yeah. and that means, I mean, our perspective is that if you can keep, it, you know, you can you can have these arrangements that have China in, then that's another way in which we can kind of all agree on standards and norms and the way we intend to trade. With each other, so those uh, those fabrics are important. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Ambassador, look, this has been a great conversation. We uh, we still have a few more questions left in the uh, in the queue, uh, but there is one that I sort of want to close on, um, and that is um, from Joe Williams, one of our one of our uh, NSI affiliates, who uh, who talks about the All Blacks, who he says are great ambassadors for the uh, for New Zealand. Uh, but he's concerned that their uh, 2021 test schedule apparently bypassed US, the U.S. in favor of Europe. And he wants to know whether the ambassador to the U.S. gets involved in scheduling of all Blacks games. And if, if so, what you can do to make sure they're playing here next season. Oh, you know, there's many things that I think I can do. But uh, anything to do with the all Blacks schedule, I think, is uh, going to require a celestial being. It is very difficult uh, to to, um, uh, to to what's the word to change or to shape. You know, I was ambassador to France in 2011 when the the Rugby World Cup was held in New Zealand. I had to know every jolly thing about the All Blacks, what they were doing, where they were playing, and at the end of that year, I said, "That's it. 
I'm never ever going to follow the All Blacks again. Now that's probably not a statement that should come out of the mouth of a New Zealand ambassador, but I'm afraid to, I haven't followed them terribly closely since uh, 2011. So I can't, I can't achieve any miracles, I'm afraid, for your questioner. Well, there we go. Well, listen, Ambassador Banks, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thanks for being our first ever foreign ambassador. The Australians are coming next month, but you beat them <laughs> to the punch. So it, it's, we're, we're excited to have you. Um, I want to tell the audience about a few events we have coming up in the near future. Uh, first, on January 21st, uh, please join NSI and Silverado, the Silverado Policy Accelerator, for a debate on the benefits of using a robust cyber offense capability, argued on my side uh, by me and Dimitri Alperovich, the ch executive chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, versus a principally defense-focused fo fo posture in cyberspace, argued by Sarah, Sarah Martin, the former CEO at the National Cybersecurity Center, and Heather Adkins, the Director of Information Security and Privacy at Google. In addition, we'll have our next NATSEC nightcap event on February 4th from 5 to 6 p.m., same time, same channel, um, where we'll feature, dis feature a discussion with the Australian ambassador to the U.S., Ambassador Arthur Sinodinos. So please also take a look at our latest, new, latest law and policy papers written by our NSI fellows covering topics from deep fakes to pandemics, to the intelligence community to 5G and future technology development. You can find all of those on our web and public, on our publications on our website. And finally, last but certainly not least, don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Check out our three awesome podcasts, Fault Lines, Iron Butterfly, NSI Live. In fact, we have a special episode recorded just today coming up this week on the terrible events of yesterday uh, of, the, of the NSI uh, Fault Lines podcast. So again, thank you, audience, for being here. Ambassador Banks, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Everybody have a great night. Thanks, Ambassador Banks. Thank you. Bye now.